Hi, and I'm delighted to welcome Jonathan Biss to my Beethoven series. Jonathan is an extraordinary pianist, really fantastic, um, and it's just delightful to have you here, Jonathan. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you for having me. Look, um, you know, Beethoven is, I, I, I know it's, it's a hot topic, if I can say so, <laughs> for you. You've done a whole course on it, um, on, on Coursera, by the way, so um, really, so, so you know the subject really in depth, but I'd like to start with a very simple question. So when, when did you notice you are sort of attracted to Beethoven that you really kind of love and feel his music? The, the first piece I remember having had a, a, having made a major impression on me was the Appassionata Sonata. Um, and I think I would have been around 10 years old, um, not more than that. And it was uh, the recording of Rudolf Serkin. I had, I had heard Beethoven's music, of course, before I had probably even played uh, one of his sonatas already. I learned Opus 26 when I was nine or 10. But th this thing, this Beethoven thing of feeling grabbed by the collar, that, it was, that was the first time. And it's, that's 30 years now, practically. And it's, you know, it, it hasn't really changed or lessened ever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, do you remember what was so special about it? Like, uh, I don't know, any kind of um, sort of memory in particular? I think it, there is a kind of a, a visceral power to Beethoven's personality. You know, we talk so much about, about the mastery and about the spirituality and about the variety, and these, these are all remarkable, but there is just this force. I mean, I think that there probably was no other composer in history who had a personality that forceful and whose need to be listened to was so intense. And I think that's what I felt. I sort of felt this, um, his urgency, you know? Um, and I, I just, um, I would not have been able to put this into words then, but the way in that piece, it may be m more than in others, but this is such a Beethoven thing in general, of taking a tiny little cell of material and wrestling with it and manipulating it and and draining every mm -hmm. ounce of possibility from it that was just so so irresistible to me so powerful so in the case of that it was so terrifying honestly and i just i remember i listened to it hundreds of times i mean it was this is still a cassette tape and yeah. it, i wore it out you know that's that's how um how much i sort of i get i needed to hear it Wow, that's that's pretty powerful. Um, and look, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I'm always afraid to ask, but maybe I can give it a go. So do you think he, we would not have had the Beethoven we had? Um, has he not had the deafness and, and things? So to do because like, um, he was a genius already from the start, you know, he, mm. he, he, he well, it was like clear also from your read and how he developed. But do you think we've got that kind of extra like like sort of spirituality because of of his deafness i mean i don't know what the chicken and what's the egg because so i i guess what i would say is that beethoven's enormous need to express himself through music come because he was deaf and he was isolated from the world or um is it the other way around? Is it possible mm -hmm. that um, because he had this enormous need to be ex to express himself anyway, mm -hmm. he survived deafness and he yeah. found some kind of a creative? I don't really know what came first. I think in terms of the personality, it seems really that it was all there. I mean, when I hear the Opus One piano trios and the Opus Two piano sonatas, I I hear that spirituality so much already. I think that probably the deafness had a profound um, impact on the language. I think if you, you look at these late pieces, which really it's, it's a cliche, but it's true that they still sound modern in many ways. I think being able to write in a language that is so 
different from anything else that was being produced in the time. I think that is connected to the fact that he was not hearing the, you know, the sounds of the of music that was being written or of the world in general. I think if you look at his ability to sort of manipulate time in the late period, I think not being, you know, um, aware of footsteps and heartbeats and, and all of the things that are metronomic in our lives. I think that probably had an enormous, uh, you know, impact on, on what he did. But in terms of the spirituality, I think that was him. I think yeah. it was in the person. And I think he had anyway, such, such an uneasy relationship with the world, even before he w went deaf, that I think the need to find solace and to find meaning in music is there long before he wrote the, the Heilig and Shah Testament in 18, 1801 or whatever it is. Yeah. Gosh, I, I mean, um, thank you. I, I think it's a very interesting answer. And um, I can't answer that like but it's it's good to know the opinions and but uh, look i mean you've done an extraordinary research i mean really i i i i mean of course there are other pianists but you are a performer who's done a like an academic work on top that's quite rare and i'm i just want to ask uh, how has your performing uh, changed you know after this huge amount of work and, and readings and everything or hasn't it not changed because it's just been like edited and like uh. uh well i would start with the caveat that i'm probably the last person to be able to be objective about it because i'm so close to it but i think um that spending so much time thinking about how to convey the greatness of this music to an audience, an audience of people who might not have had much prior experience with it, and how to convey not just its greatness, but its, um, its invention, mm -hmm. you know, because that's for me one, definitely one of the miracles of the Beethoven Sonatas is the, the variety of expression and the variety of form and the, the variety of, of possibilities that he, he utilizes. I think, that has made me more, that's, that's put the side of the music that's wild and that is daring more at the forefront for me. And it's made me feel more of a responsibility um, to convey that aspect of it, to make people who are listening to me play it um, imagine that I'm imagining it in real time, you know, and that I'm living it in real time. I think that you know, having experienced Schumann and Wagner and Bruckner and Schoenberg and Stravinsky and Zanakis and Ligeti and I don't know, Cage and whoever else, it's sometimes hard for us now to hear the unbelievable harmonic daring mm -hmm. of going to the median in the Waldheim Sonata or, or beginning 111 the way he does. I think it's, we simply have too much context, you know? Yeah. And I think doing this work where I'm where more than anything else trying to make people feel the, the, the wildness and the daring, I think that, that aspect and how to, how to make it real has been mm -hmm. sort of more important to me than it was before. I mean, you talk about this innovation and, um, but uh, so, I think for pianists and uh, for musicians, you know, it's um, obvious how to look for it. You know, we, we are familiar with theories and, and harmony, hope, hopefully. <laughs> but um, for the public, so, you know, what were the kind of the points that can make the public really realize that that's kind of shifted and stuff, you think? Yeah, it's, it's tricky because I don't, expect or even necessarily want the public to be thinking um, about the sort of the harmonic motion mm -hmm. as in terms of this happens and this happens, this happens, this happens. Um, what I've tried to do over and over again is to talk about what the norms mm -hmm. of the classical period were mm -hmm. um, so that people some maybe are a little bit more aware of when Beethoven deviated from mm -hmm. the norms. Because I think ultimately that's what structure really is. It's about mm -hmm. expectation. 
and it's about when the composer fulfills an expectation or when he subverts it. And I think that's very powerful. And I think I've just, so I've, I guess what I've tried to do is to build up the sense of expectation in the you know person who watched the course a little bit. And then also just to instill the idea of music as narrative, not just language, but as narrative. So you don't, again, you don't have to, I don't really care if anyone who watches the lecture remembers what the dominant and what the median are. You know, it's somehow not the point, but just to understand that every event in the music tells a story, not, not a literal story, but, a, but an emotional story. And that just to, to suggest to people that every choice the composer makes about where the line goes and where the harmony goes, is um, is a choice that's made at the expense of another choice. You know, it's like this is about the about the music going here as opposed to there. And I think once you're conditioned to listen to that way, even if you don't know anything about harmony and counterpoint, I think you're already more alive to the sense of storytelling and the sense of of um, of music as a means of of conveying feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very interesting. And um and look, another question about, you know, piano sonatas, let's talk maybe now more specifically. Um, so, I mean, he really wasn't kind of happy writing most of them. You know, they were just literally kind of pot boilers. I, I saw that world, I thought like it was amazing. So, um, what, what my question really is, so, it also felt that, you know, the publishers were queuing up for them, so they're very popular, but not, I mean, basically, um, I can't remember, there was only one sonata that was played, right? So I think in public. Another one. In, yeah, exactly. So if I remember correctly. So, so um, and these sonatas are extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. So can we assume that just the level of musicality and musical technique and just people who are able to do it uh, was just like through the roof? Yeah, I think what what we can assume mostly is that somehow Beethoven wasn't very concerned about it. I mean, I think that's one of the most important um, sort of pieces of background information mm -hmm. when thinking about what role these pieces played in his life and his professional life, that the symphonies were performed, right? So if the, if the, the orchestra couldn't play it pretty well, or if the audience couldn't understand it pretty well, there were consequences, right? But if these sonatas weren't being played publicly, if they were for the home consumption, how serious really were the consequences mm -hmm. if people weren't up to them? And I think that's why these sonatas really um, are more daring than the pieces that would have been more public and they are more of a laboratory. Um, in terms of Beethoven um, expanding the form and um, and um, imagining new possibilities for what a sonata might be. I mean, you listen to Opus 7 and Opus 78 and the Wallstein and the Tempest and Opus 90 and tell me what makes all of those a sonata. I mean, the, the variety of the shape is so absolutely enormous. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that that's really interesting. And uh, look, um, also my sort of a personal really question, since you really know the subject well, and I haven't yet found the answer. So Beethoven's relationship to Haydn, I think it's not as obvious as kind of people could, I mean, you know, it just says, oh, Haydn, Beethoven, you know, two geniuses. And, um, but as I understand, not all rosy in a way, right? No. Um... There, uh, I think Beethoven was probably the type of personality who resented the idea that he had learned something from someone. I think it was not a comfortable thought for him that he might owe any kind of debt to anyone in any way. I think it, particularly when it came to his creativity, I think he wanted to believe that he was fully formed. I think it was easier for him to idolize Mozart because he never met him, you know. Um, and apparently Beethoven was, um, was pretty resentful of 
Haydn's judgment of the, op the Opus One trios, which he sent them. He, like, Haydn didn't, didn't didn't like the third of them, the C minor trio, or at least he he had reservations about it or about Beethoven publishing it, and Beethoven didn't really get over it. Um, um, and so I think that that there are, his personal feeling for ha about Haydn is very complicated. I think there is, however. No question that Beethoven learned from Haydn, and I think ultimately he has much more in common with him as a personality than he does with Mozart. Mm -hmm. I think he, um, first of all, the ability to combine the spiritual and the the human, the rough, even the the comic, the the. Um, I don't want to say the profane, but let's say the profane. Um, that's very much a quality that I associate with Haydn, much more than with Mozart. And I, I, I also think, again, this delight in surprise, this sort of hyper-awareness of what the audience thinks is coming and just sort of on purpose not doing that. I think with Haydn, it's maybe more of a game than it is with Beethoven. With Beethoven, it tends to be more out of a deep need to express things this way. But it's it's still, it's definitely out of um, Haydn's toolbox, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think there, there is a profound connection whether or not it made Beethoven happy to acknowledge it. You just mentioned that um, Mozart and Beethoven haven't ever met, but they're, they're at least in, in biographies I read, there is this account of Mozart's biographer describing that. You think it's not true? It, it, it is a subject for some debate. I mean, I think certainly closer to the time they, the, there were biographers who said that they met, but there is, I mean, if you read more contemporary accounts, there is no evidence of it anyway. Um, maybe they met, they, they didn't have a relationship. And certainly this, this idea that uh, uh, he would study with with Mozart upon coming to Vienna, that we know didn't come to pass. You know, so at the at the most they met, but they did not have the relationship that Beethoven mm -hmm. envisioned when, yeah, he yeah. The, when he made the trip. To Vienna. Yeah, and um, look, I mean the the piano sonatas they are really, I mean, extraordinarily, you know, different as you said. I mean, it's strange to us, but do you have any favorites or like, let's say? the moments where you really think, gosh, this is like so dear to my heart, you know, um, so if, if you could share. It changes very mm -hmm. often because again, I think the, the, the content, the emotional content is so varied that the ones that speak to me most, it, very, it depends very much on my state of mind and where I am in my life. Um, I will say that there is, I have kind of a special thing for Opus 90. I think maybe because of all of the qualities that I might, you know, if you ask me what is Beethoven's personality, all the qualities I might just sort of naturally mention, tenderness would not be high on the list. And so those moments when he actually is very, very tender as he is in the second movement of Opus 90, I find unbelievably moving. I mean, and especially this, the first movement is has so much conflict and so much anguish in it and the way that that anguish just gives way to something so open hearted and the, the end of the first movement of Opus 90 ends with this downward minor key scale and then it just instantly reverses into the major and I, it's just it's like you feel the heart open. Um, so that's a place that's very, very dear to me. I think because it's the first of the late sonatas I learned, uh, Opus 109 is a piece which is, and again, I think there's maybe more tenderness in it than in a lot of Beethoven. I mean, and there's also, there's just something about the way in which the theme of the last movement, which is so beautiful already at the beginning, is utterly transformed uh, when it returns, basically, what's mm. what's taken, what's, what's been done to it in the yeah. interim. Mm -hmm. So that is a special favorite. Um, I adore the pastoral sonata. I think mm -hmm. that there's something about its slow unfolding, which is um, incredibly moving. Um, and then I will also say that one of the the 
joy, the greatest joys of playing the cycle is that you spend so much time with some of these early sonatas that you kind of know in theory are amazing, but you don't really spend the time with them they deserve. I mean, oh, there is nothing more profound in the slow movement of Opus 2, number 3. Um, Opus 7 is a totality, I find, just absolutely miraculous. Um, yeah, I could, I don't know, I could keep going. Uh, but those are some of my, my special loves. And look, uh, so, I mean, the cycle is huge, right? I mean, unbelievable. So how, how did you structure or how do you structure your practice um, to cover everything? Like, do you have a map or? I did. I mean, it was, you know, I ended up very sadly not finishing the performed cycle anywhere because of COVID. All of them were, I had, I had played as many as five of the seven concerts in some venues, but there was still two to go. So that's a, it's a real loss. Um, but I, yes, I had a map. I had, um, I had written out when I first had to play each one of the 32 over the course of the season and sort of, and then I counted backwards from that to how prepared each one of them had to be. And it was kind of, um, uh, a cross reference with when I had most recently played. It was the whole to do. And then, at the, but in the end, there's no choice but to have a certain degree of trust because when you play all of them in a year, you will never practice them as much as you would under normal circumstances, which is why I sort of, I recorded them over nine years because I wanted to feel that when I came to that point where I was going to play them as a cycle, I, I you know, I had, would have lived with them for so long that hopefully, you know, some yeah. kind of osmosis will, would be doing some of the work for me instead of having to practice it as much as I normally would. Yeah. Look, I mean, you also had, uh, you know, um, lessons like masterclass with um, one of the most, I think, important Beethoven interpreters, Daniel Barenboim. Yeah. Um, so was there something specific you took from him? Yes. In fact, it, it relates to something I just said. So I played the last movement of Opus 109. And I sometimes think that the best things that... Um, can be said about music are the ones that you had never occurred to you before, but as soon as you hear them, they seem completely obvious. Mm -hmm. And he said something about this, about this last move and, and about the recurrence of the theme, which I think about every time I play it. And in fact, every time I think about anything that's cyclical at all, he says, you have to play it differently um, when it comes back, because when it comes back, it has a past. Whereas at the beginning, it has only a future. Mm. Um, and that is both um, to the point and profound. And again, I think all of the thinking that I do about structure is kind of related to that idea, you know, that everything you hear is informed by everything you heard before it. Yeah, gosh, very interesting. Very interesting. And of course, um, the charisma um, as well. Uh, I mean, I think so. When you were growing up, so, um, you know, of course you mentioned like Serking and you played to Byron Bomb. So uh, were there periods of time where you felt like you were not copying, but really your style or your interpretation would gravitate towards certain interpreters? You know, not consciously, but, and I always, even when I was young, I had, um, a philosophy that I shouldn't be listening to performances of a piece I was working on. Um, I was, of course, influenced by lots of people, but I tried to avoid the specific performances. Um, but I will say that, you know, I spent four years studying with Leon Fleischer, who is, I mean, you just used the word charisma in another context. I mean, there, he's, the, the intensity of his personality and of his love for music and of his, his, um, I often think, so would, I would say that the intensity of his integrity is, is so shocking really that you can't, you know, when you're around it a lot, as I was, it can't help to have a huge influence on you. I remember, um, about three years after leaving Curtis, where I studied with him, um, a friend who I'd gone to school with came backstage to one of my concerts and said, you know, it's great to hear you now because you sound really like yourself. Uh, and there was a time when you started to sound 
and I remember the word, he said uncomfortably like, like Fleischer, because yeah, Fleischer has a way of playing that, I mean, none of us could ever achieve it. I mean, it's so, it belongs to him. Um, and so, yeah, I think he was a humongous influence and maybe, you know, I never, of course, met Schnabel, but I, I, I certainly in terms of the content of what he talked about, I think a lot of it was very connected to his time with Schnabel. So I think that was a, that, that lineage was a, was a big deal in my life. When you're imagining Beethoven, what sort of adjectives come into your mind? Stubborn, idealistic, humane, um, intense. I think those are the main ones. Because in terms of, again, in terms of character, he covers everything. But those the qualities are just the essence of him, I think. So based on sort of, um, you know, biographical um, descriptions and everything and, you know, the material that we have around it. So like, what would be uh, the, like the best behavior to get on with him? Oh, my God. Um, it's hard to tell because I don't think he took well to being challenged. But I also don't think he respected people who were genuflecting. So I, I don't know. I mean, I would be utterly terrified to meet him, to be honest. Um, never mind even to play for him, God forbid. But I mean, even just, just to know him, I don't think... I've often thought, because, you know, people ask that question often, who are the composers who you would like to know? Beethoven is not actually on the list because I feel like, unlike Mozart, who I, I adore maybe equally to Beethoven, I don't feel that I know him so well mm -hmm. from the music. But I somehow think I know Beethoven as well as I want to know him from the music. I know exactly what is beautiful about him from the music. And I think, I, I, I worry anyway that meeting him would just be traumatic. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan, look, uh, thank you so much. Um, it's been a terrific conversation. Uh, so many wonderful things and insights. And hope to hear you back here in London. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Pleasure to talk to you. And I so, yeah, so hope that the time when we can be in a room together and make music in front of one another is not too, too, too far away. Well, thank you again for being my guest. Really a pleasure. Thank you so much.